Gracious Holy God, we give you thanks that you have called us to be one. That you have prayed for us that we might be one. And that in the gospel as we read it, we even hear that you have prayed not just for your disciples who surrounded you on that day, but even for us, those who would come to believe because of the word that was shared from one generation to the next and from one community to the next, so that the kingdom of God might continue to grow and be built. Gracious God, thank you that we hear your word in different languages and in different ways today, and that as we share the, the gospel together amongst ourselves, that you empower us to go out into all the world and share the good news that there is a Savior that has come to set us free. Lord, be with us as we travel today, as we travel throughout our synod and through our companion synods, that we might learn and become more aware of the opportunities that lie ahead for the people of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray that God's people say, Amen. 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 We are a church that believes God is calling us into the world together. Those are actually not my words. Those are the words of Bishop Schaefer uh, uh, from the Florida Bahamas Synod. And of course, he's actually borrowing them also from Bishop Eaton. And so really, the Evangelical Lutheran Church is trying to make a point of stating that we are a church together. Folks, it's not just what's happening here at Member Pines. It's not just here in the community of living faith but that we are stretching and reaching to be the church all around the world. So what we are looking to do is to walk together to accomplish things on a scale and a scope that we never could do on our own. And so this morning, rather than my regular sermon, I'm really giving you a slide presentation uh, of, of some of the things that are happening through the Synod, through the Global Mission Committee, and uh, through that also through what is called the Companion Synod Program. Uh, that is one way that we really reach out into uh, the whole world. Does anybody know in the Florida Bahamas who our companion synods are? We have four churches and one seminary. And they are the Lutheran Church in Haiti, Suriname, Guyana, and Cuba, and the United Theological Seminary in Kingston, Jamaica. So we have quite a reach there. Through this last year, the global mission team of the Florida Bahamas Synod was completely revamped, re-energized, uh, and, uh, and I'm proud to say that even though I've been a pastor in this synod for, for some 11 years now, uh, I'm now serving on the global mission committee uh, of the synod, so I have a personal interest to, in sharing with you what it is that we're doing, trying to build our relationships of international accompaniment and bringing a higher visibility and profile to them. And so, there's a word, accompaniment. Does anybody know what that word means? What does it mean to accompany? To go along with. To go along with, exactly. And so when we say we are going along with, we are going together on the road, not as those who have it over or those who are under, but as partners. We are going together on the road as partners. And so the partnership that exists is between the Florida Bahamas Synod and the Lutheran Church in Haiti. Now, I'm going to focus on this one part because that's the task force that I serve on. Uh, and not only that, but also because Dr. Ken Vermillion prepared this beautiful slide presentation, uh, so I'm sharing that. But they, you can get presentations on our other countries that we are partnering with as well. So here is a Caribbean base and a quick map. Haiti, the western one-third of the island of Hispaniola. And you see Florida up there near the top. Uh, we now see in the ELH, which is the Église Lutherienne de Haiti. I don't say it nearly as well as our sister pronounces it. Uh, and you see that they now, I know you probably can't see all the labels and tags, but you can get a sense there are ten churches throughout this country uh, that are now part of the ELH, which is for a very young church, pretty impressive. How did our relationship with Haiti begin? It began when we were first assigned a companion synod, and the first one we were assigned to was India. Well, the Global Mission Committee said, you know, we have so many people in our congregations and in our communities who are from the Caribbean nations, could we get a companion synod in the Caribbean nations instead? And so the, the, the church said, yes. 
And so instead of getting one, we got four plus a seminary. So we increased by fivefold uh, what we're doing. And then how did we get involved specifically in Haiti? Really that came out of the experience of the swine fever epidemic prior to 1998, really when the relationship was starting to form. And uh, there was a swine uh, fever epidemic, the, the, the pork, the, the pigs had to be slaughtered. And so now they had to find a way to restore a, sense, uh, a source of income and, and food. The Florida Bahamas Synod was of course just one partner, but committed $16,000 a year towards what they call the Pig Project. And two people, uh, Pastor Luther and his wife Dottie Kistler, went to Haiti to rep represent the Synod and uh, as they started to distribute pigs. Does anybody, was anybody around the Synod and remembers? I see some, some hand, yes, so you remember the, the program. And so a lot has happened over the 16 years. Uh, and and here's, here's a quick rundown list. We're going to look at it a little bit more carefully. But you see what's going, gone on in the last years. Here are some of our pioneers, Pastor Luther and Dottie Kistler. Um, I, the only one on this list that I know besides that are Pat Hansen, who's now retired from, from travel. But she made over 50 trips to Haiti in the last 16 years. Um, Pastor Steve Weinmiller is a good friend of mine. And Mary Gilles, and I, I know a little bit, she just resigned from the committee. But here they are, the father and mother of the ELH, Pastor Luther, and I don't know why his head is, is disembodied floating over the, the land there like that, <laughs> uh, but he's there with Porky, and Porky must have been real special too, and his wife Dottie Kistler. And so in 1999, the FLH, which is the Federación Luterienne de Haiti, uh, was created by Haitian pastors. It wasn't put in place by some other organization, but pastors and lady in Haiti said, we need a federation. So that happened in 1999. And in that same year, they began what they call the Pagan Pastor Program. And they uh, had it as two parts. The pig part was to say, we have material needs, which includes pigs, but also many other things. And uh, so that part was there. And then the pastor part referred to that they also had spiritual needs. And so there was a, a need for spiritual nourishment. So uh, building congregations in a church that will help their own people to grow was part of that. Here are some of the founders, and I'm sorry that I don't have their names, uh, but these uh, are some of the founders of the FLH back in 1999. And uh, we established a mission statement between the Florida Bahamas Synod and the FLH, which was that we are committed to companion with the Lutheran Church of Haiti to walk together in faith and action, to learn from one another, and to empower the Lutheran Church in Haiti to become self-supporting so that it could minister physically and spiritually to the nation. So in 2000, the first pastor started to travel down there. Pastor Bob Baer was the, pastor, the chair of the Synod's Global Mission Committee. Uh, and others went down. They started to see what kind of things needed to happen and could happen. Uh, one of the women on the, on the group, Denise Benjamin, who later became a pastor, uh, was able to help them set up a, a program called Cafe Haiti, which is now marketed through Equal Exchange. Have any of you heard of Equal Exchange or Fair Trade, yes. sometimes yes. called? So a lot of churches serve Fair Trade coffee during their coffee hours, um, and, and it, it's to help support people in developing countries uh, when, they, when they do that. Um, I don't know all of these folks here. Uh, in fact, the only one I can tell you is, is um, uh, Pat Hansen, which is the second from the right. Uh, in blue, and uh, 50 plus trips, she's the second mother of the ELH, a uh, very dedicated woman. Denise Benjamin, who I said later, later became a pastor, she developed the Cafe Haiti program, she's now in Michigan. In 2001, more members of the Synod made, uh, made a, a trip to Haiti to learn about how to work together in a way that was <coughs> responsible and authentic, not to say, we're here to do this for you, or uh, to, to help you to learn something, but to really work together. And so they began to, uh, to meet, they, they worked work out of the Catholic retreat house first, and then uh, learn more about Haiti and the, evaluate the, the peak program there. This gentleman, I don't know either, Michael Kuhn, was a LWF, Lutheran World Federation representative, who helped them with a lot of logistics. And they began a program of theological training that's gone from 20 from 2002 all the way to this year, and it is continuing. 
And uh, here's a group. Now, what they've been doing is they were training pastors and deacons in, uh, in Haiti. And I want to show you, I can't really point it, but the bottom right, you can only see the head of a, of a person on the far bottom right, uh, is uh, Livingston Lavanis, and um, I'll tell you more about him in just a moment. But just remember that picture. Here it is just, this is a group of students who are preparing as deacons and eventually as pastors. They were training in Carrefour. This was in 2007. Now, these two, the pastor on the left is Pastor Steve Weinmiller. He is from uh, Faith Lutheran Church in Sarasota. He has also logged, I don't know how many trips. And then Marcia Gregg, who for the life of me, Cheryl, I keep looking at saying, she could be your sister. <laughs> Every time I've looked at that picture, I said, that's Cheryl's sister. <laughs> uh, she's been, she was very helpful as well. And this is uh, the last deacon training that happened, which was in January of 2014. I had planned to go on that trip, as I had planned to go on the years before trip. Uh, but this particular trip, I didn't get a chance to go because a congregation was in the middle of a call process calling a new pastor. And so I stayed. <laughs> but God willing, uh, January 2015, I will attend and go part, uh, become part of that training. I want you to see not only the people who are there, and even though you won't recognize the people, but also the structure. And that structure is part of the new ELH compound and that is all post-earthquake construction. So that didn't exist before. Teacher training started to take place between 2002 and 2010 with grants from various different places. They stopped using teachers from the United States mostly because the language barrier was too much. People weren't understanding and there, there were cultural situations. So they turned the program over to a group called Beyond Borders, Limye Lavi, uh, which was a contract to, to continue um, the, the, the training. Some highlights from 2004, so this is now 10 years ago. Joseph Livingston Lovanis, he was the one I pointed to a moment ago in the picture, entered the United uh, Theological College of the West Indies in Jamaica, so one of our other partners, uh, and began his seminary training, while Denise Benjamin, who was from the city here, also began her theological training at Gettysburg. And another pastor, Shelley Satran, who became a missionary, and she, uh, a part-time missionary for the Synod, along with her husband, who was part of the Beyond Borders program. So she's fluent in Creole. This is Shelley Satran. She's now a pastor in Vero Beach at our Savior Lutheran Church. Um, I don't know where she learned her, her Creole, but um, she's very fluent with that. And so here are teachers uh, and parents in, in Theot. Theote? I'm not sure exactly believed uh, in education so much they built their own school. And what a structure. Very, very uh, uh, elementary in a sense. In 2005, uh, several pastors, and it's hard to say exactly, but the one in the center uh, with the white shirt is Pastor Alfred and Neil. And uh, Nancy and I recently had the opportunity to host him at our home uh, as he was coming through with Pastor Lavanis. 2006, uh, so much was going on. They began to use St. Joseph's Maison as the guest house for, for, for their trips. They finished their constitution, contact, contact with the church in Canada and with the Episcopal Church in Haiti. Emmanuel Lutheran in Venice, Florida uh, became a church that really did a lot of great work in supporting what was happening there and uh, teacher training continued. And they also developed the the women's group, uh, the, the Femmes de Felda. Hmm. Felda. Ah, there it is, thank you. <laughs> uh, began. St. Joseph's Home for Boys was the guest house. And here's sort of the first indication, of course, of things that we know were to come. Uh, they stayed in the guest house, you see, both pre-earthquake pre and then post-earthquake. Uh, our bishop at the time was Bishop Edward Benaway, and he traveled down there many times here meeting with the bishop from the Episcopal Church, and he did uh, help with um, theological training as well. Pastor David Johnson, who has now passed away, uh, who was the pastor at Emmanuel in Venice, and who was a great support and force in making things happen there. In 2007, they started doing medical mission trips as well. Uh, a few pastors had some misgivings and left the, uh, the program that was going on, but in the large part it continued. They started doing theological training in power for that year. 
And then mission trips and adventures, it says. There's Pastor Steve Weinmiller from Sarasota again, and Dr. Steve Newman, one of our, our doctors. And they worked along with the Village of Hope and Lazarus Project. Some nice structures that are, uh, that are here. And then this is a medical mission team from 2012. And again, this is in front of the new headquarters building that was built post-earthquake. So there's some, some real things that we can look at now and say, even after the earthquake and the devastation, uh, the tragedy that took place there, there's some new things happening. Uh, and, and this was a group that went two years ago in 2012. We've been having two different sets of group every year, medical mission and theological training. So those have been the two groups of people that have gone down in the last couple of years. Uh, 2008, even more highlights. I, I love that the, one of the highlights that they note here is, uh, look at number three, the first wedding at a Lutheran church in Haiti, which was in Petitclaw. Uh, on May 24th of 2008. Those kind of things that become so important. Uh, and then also seeing the progress as uh, pastors and students are going through. Here is the graduation of Pastor Livingston Lavanis. I hope you can see the picture okay. He's wearing the blue robe and uh, he's there. I'm guessing that's his father standing next to him who now lives in, oh it's that distant city called Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then the picture on the, on the right, where you see a number of people, including two pastors, uh, and then you see another person in a blue uh, graduation robe, and I can't remember her last name right now, but uh, I had a chance to meet her in June, and she's Pastor Diana from Guyana. <laughs> That's how we remember her. So they, they graduated together and continue uh, in, in partnership. Here's that first wedding, uh, and there's some more wedding pictures. Uh, I, I look at this particular picture and say, you know, when we talk about we have things to learn both ways, you know, here's a church that started with, you know, hardly a building in 2008, and now today they could show us how to build a building. Uh, look at that in 2014. What a beautiful building they have, and you'll see some more of the churches. Teacher training continues. Uh, you see the, the folks over there. And in 2009, really sort of marked a new beginning uh, as pastors were being ordained. So, three pastors ordained in January: Pastors Alma, Emil, and Livingston. I know the latter two. And then in August, Pastor Duclair was also ordained. And then they also began what is called the Église Luterienne de Haiti. Remember, before it was just a federation, but now they said we are actually a church body, just like the ELCA. Now you have the ELH, the Église Luterienne de Haiti. And Pastor Livingston Lovanas was called to head the new church as its own separate body. Can you imagine being ordained as a pastor and in the same year become the head of the national church uh, that is just being born? What a huge, huge responsibility. And so certainly pray for him. Right now, at this very moment, Pastor uh, Livingston is at a, in a two-month training program in Kenya. Uh, learning administration and so forth, as a lot of things are happening in the church, they found the need for, for some more training in that area. The ordination itself, as it took place, Bishop Benaway was there, uh, and you see the ordinance who were who there before at the Holy Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. I hope you can see the beauty of the inside of this building with the drawings and murals on the back walls. Um, of course, January 31st, 2009 would tell you that it's just almost, not quite a year, until the tragedy of the earthquake, and we'll see another picture of this church. Uh, here are some folks who were at the ordination, and this on the right here, uh, picture of course, Pastor Livingston Lovanis, uh, the new head of the ELH, uh, along with uh, Pastor uh, Benjamin, and uh, uh, Luther Kistler, one of those founding pastors, and uh, Pat Hansen, the mother uh, of the ELCA. Uh, they've had numerous trips and visits in the years since, to, uh, to Haiti, and then of course we get to 2010, January 12th, the earthquake that took place. They had just finished their January theological training session. Uh, ben Larson uh, was a Lutheran seminary student from Wartburg, uh, and he's here, he's, he's the one in the white shirt uh, on the left there, uh, who was killed when, they, when that building collapsed in the earthquake. Uh, his wife on the far right and his brother in between them. And there were all three of them there at the time. This is his brother and his, his widow. And you see what happened to them all. Tragedy and triumph.
This is the cathedral where the ordination took place that you just saw the inside of the murals and the whole building was devastated. These pictures, I'm sure you've seen the presidential palace as it was before and then in its collapsed state. Post-earthquake playground. The cathedral of Notre Dame, of course, also completely destroyed. Hundreds of thousands in mass burial sites. You see the man carrying crosses. It's the only marker that they were able to put on. In the midst of that, hope and the resurrection of the ELH begins. And you see another wedding. This time not a one wedding, but eight couples being married uh, all at the same time. And Pastor Denise Benjamin, by that time, uh, an ordained pastor herself, who helped officiate at that wedding. And here they come in post droit coming in. And so there was a resurrection from the destruction taking place in the years 2011 through 2014. With their leadership team intact and in place, the tallest one, who's the second from the left, is Pastor Livingston. Uh, and then the one in the blue shirt with the stripes going sideways, Pastor Danielle. I, I only point those out because, again, they're the ones that I've met personally. They've stayed at our home. And uh, they're part of our, our uh, partners in the work that we're doing. And again, you see accompaniment model for mission work, working together as partners, as equal partners, rather than what used to be the colonial model of ministry and mission. So this is hand in hand, mutuality, inclusivity, empowerment, and sustainability, working to make the church sustainable by itself. Pastor Livingston and Jorel Cart, who is, uh, I believe he's a deacon, you can't maybe tell, but if you see that shirt that he's wearing, that white shirt, and you see the logo, that's the logo from Luther Springs, uh, our camp in, here in Florida. And uh, two, two great guys, too. Here is the ELH headquarters. Uh, this is all built after the earthquake. Mary Dellison, who was one of our team members, who was uh, resting at the guest house here. And these are the guest houses. They built nine of them. Three of them are complete. The other six are still being worked on and a gazebo in the guest house. You know what happens? A lot of money comes in, a lot of promises get made, it's never enough money, so some of the things are still trying to be finished. It's still happening, little by little. They have not just their churches that they're building, but also community centers. They have a concrete block factory. Can you imagine how useful that would be, right? Uh, their former sugar cane processing plant, I don't know anything more about the story of that. Here's their unfinished dormitory for vocational training. And their new elementary school. Isn't that beautiful? I really hope it's big enough that you can see it. It's really beautiful. Good stuff happening there. They have some dairies in two of their uh, congregations. And here they're pasteurized and sterilized, and then they wash and fill the bottles manually. A cow that was uh, brought in by the Cans for Cows project. Uh, that was a church in Port Charlotte, Pope Lutheran Church. And here's their chart. Uh, what they did was collect cans, and I guess they just took the weight of the cans. So for one cow, you need 52,000 cans collected. Scrap metal value is $500. That's one cow. That church donated 25 cows. So you do the math. That's a lot of cans. <laughs> I, I lift that up because it's just a, a way of saying, you know, when people say, oh, we don't know what we can do. Well... We can be imaginative and come up with some things. They came up with some incredible ideas here. Uh, in Redemption, uh, this was uh, in 2010. You see they had a church in a tent there, in a temporary site. Now there's a church building. And you see the view from outside the church as well as inside the church with their folding chairs. We know about folding chairs. Uh, Faith Church, uh, which has a sister congregation, Faith Ormond Beach. So faith and faith. Um, and you see the structure that they began with in 2001 and where they're at now in 2013 with a, with a, a stronger structure. Um, Pastor du Duclair, I have not met him. He's on a well that they're building there as well. This is in Jerusalem, Ostroy. And Hope Lutheran Church in the village has provided funds to build this church. And this is Redemption Pasquette. Uh, what a beautiful building this is. You see it here on the outside. Now, I don't know if it has windows. I can't tell if it does. A lot of times they don't. 
uh, but it's a beautiful building. It looks like it's not, right? This is the inside of that same building. So it looks open. And they received funds in a newly constructed well happening there as well. Here's Faith Petigua. This is the church we saw, the old and the new before. Now we see the inside as well. And the fact that we now have what's called a Memorandum of Understanding, a Memorandum of Intent, that's a MOU, MOI. That's fancy ELCH language to say, this is how we're going to work together. And we have a, 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 a determined way of how we're going to continue to work together. Look at this last paragraph. The problems and challenges in Haiti are monumental. It may take generations to see a significant change. The work cannot be done alone. This agreement with all parties working together will certainly be a positive force as the ELH continues to move forward with their ministry. So there's a number of things that are happening right now. Continued visits. Uh, this past summer we had the Caribbean consultation, which you see number three for some strategic planning. And you also see Deacon's training scheduled for January 3rd through the 9th, 2015. And I hope that will be the first in a series of ones that I actually do get to go to. Uh, other than the ones I have not been able to go to in the past. Uh, the Caribbean consultation took place just before the Synod Assembly this summer. And here we are able to bring together representatives from all of our companion churches, uh, including, if you see Bishop um, Schaefer standing in the, right next to the font, immediately to his left is the bishop from Cuba, and uh, uh, two standing behind him is the sister of the bishop, we also have here Pastor Livingston, and in the, in the back, uh, Pastor Livingston, and also Pastor Diana from? Guyana. Guyana, and uh, several representatives from Suriname, as well as, uh, of course, from, from Haiti, and some folks from the ELCA. So we have a whole representation. We had workshops that were taking place. Uh, in this picture, you could actually see a pastor that you might know uh, in that picture. And that was at the consultation this past uh, June as we were pr prior to our Senate Assembly. And we're continuing to move forward, reevaluating every piece that goes on, developing a plan. They're now looking at a plan, you know, they have such sporadic electricity, but you know what they have a lot of is sun. So they're looking at putting solar panels on top of the building so that they can provide all their electricity uh, without having to buy it and pr provide electricity for, for their buildings and their structures and looking at what's going to be happening with them. So, thank you. This thank you really comes from Dr. Ken Vermillion because he was the presenter of these slides and uh, he put the whole story together, so we're grateful to him. He's the former uh, co-chair of the task force on Haiti. And I hope you've enjoyed your tour, your quick, uh, uh, you know, you didn't need a passport, you didn't need to pack your bags, but uh, you saw something, you learned something, and, and I hope you enjoyed that experience. For me, it's been exciting as a pastor. I used to be part of the Global Mission Committee in, uh, in Metro New York Synod when I was a pastor there, and I traveled with them to Tanzania, uh, and it was an incredible, life-changing experience to do that, and I'm looking forward to the experience of connecting uh, now with Haiti and with our other companion churches, and connecting us as a church with them as well. You know, one of the things that we did today, folks dressed, uh, and, and, and I told folks, you know, people said, I'm American, what should I wear? I said, wear jeans and flip-flops, you know? Uh, but if you have something else, you know, we see some folks who have, uh, have come, and, and how we're presenting ourselves and opening ourselves to what God is doing in our midst. Part of that also is to say, what are our financial opportunities? What are our opportunities to give? Uh, Nancy and I are making a commitment, we're going to give $100 a month towards the Global Mission Committee. We're going to give it through Living Faith with the encouragement that Living Faith may consider doing something as well. Some of you may be feeling, yeah, I want to give something as well. I want to make a commitment. And maybe every month you'll, you'll say, you know, however much it is that you want to, to send, and that we might be able to send, you know, anywhere from $100, $200 to the Synod. Keeping in mind we have our own needs, but keeping in mind that we are called to be one with our brothers and sisters throughout the, the, the world, and certainly our companion a sin has become a place where we can do that. So I lift all of that up to you as part of Jesus' prayer, that we may all be one, that we may be found worthy of our calling and continue forward in the things of God. Amen.